so excited to be coming together and sitting under the next part of our series in the book of Revelation. So please have your Bibles open in front of you. We're in chapters four and five this week. And one of the beautiful things we've seen so far in the book of Revelation is that what Revelation does is gives us a greater and truer perspective on not just our own lives, but in the reality of who God is and what he's been doing in the course of history. And one thing that struck me this week is just to consider how kind and how gracious God is. Think of John exiled to the island of Patmos for being a faithful witness, that God would reveal himself in this way to encourage and to use John in that place. Think about the churches in Asia Minor that we read about last week, how kind and how gracious is God in the midst of circumstantial pressure, in the midst of cultural pressure to compromise and to give in to to who God is, to following him, that he would reveal himself in this way to them. How kind and how gracious is God to give us the letter of revelation down through the course of history and right into our particular context today where we have our own particular cultural pressures to compromise the gospel of Jesus, our own circumstantial pressures to give up in the following of Jesus. How kind and how gracious is God? So so what is it that God wants John, the churches in Asia Minor, and us today to see and to hear? What is it? Well, Well, when you think about what we've seen already in the book of Revelation, think about the three chapters we've looked at. They are foundational and today chapters four and five are really foundational to understanding the whole letter of Revelation. What have we seen? What does God want us to see and to hear? He wants us to see a true picture of who Jesus is. He unveiled Jesus to us beautifully in chapter one. He revealed that Jesus, uh, though he came in his first coming, meek and mild, vulnerable and weak as a babe, but the risen, ruling, reigning Jesus is all powerful. He's all knowing, he's all seeing, and he's in the midst of his people. Think of the comfort that brings to John, to the churches in Asia Minor, and to us today. What God wants us to see is who Jesus really is. And what God wants us to hear that we saw in chapters two and three is that he knows what we're going through. He sees what we're enduring and he hears our prayers and he calls us to overcome, to conquer, to be victorious, to keep going. Why? Because there is a greater reality. There's a greater perspective. It's a reality and perspective of who God is and what he has called us to be. We're to live in light of who Jesus is. And this week in chapters four and five, what God wants us to see and what God wants us to hear is the throne room of heaven itself, the very epicenter of the control room of the whole of everything that exists, that has ever existed and will ever exist. At the very center of it, the one who rules and reigns is God himself. We are given an invitation into the throne room and we're gonna see who's at the center of it. We're gonna see the one that is worshiped. And these chapters one, four and five sit as bookends and as foundations foundational pillars to the whole book of Revelation to awaken us to see who God really is, to see what reality really is. So much so when we listen to it and see it, it utterly transforms our perspective today. I don't know about you, but that is something that we need so much more on every single moment of every day because if you're anything like me and my sinfulness, I want to suck everything in this world to be about me. I want to, I view everything through the lens of me. What's happening to me? How does that impact me? What does that mean for me? And that's in my selfishness and in my pride and in my sin. What, what wakens me up from that and pulls me out of that? is a true perspective and sight and glimpse of who Jesus really is and the throne room of heaven. And think about those chapters, one, four, and five. Not only are they pillars to the whole book of Revelation, but sandwiched in between them is this weak, fragile, vulnerable, seemingly insignificant group of people called the church who are messed up, jacked up, experiencing all sorts of pressures, yet God would reveal himself to them and say, this is what's really going on. It's not that the church is the center of the existence of God, but rather they are the center of the outpouring and affection of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These chapters sandwich these churches so that they would be comforted and assured that in their endeavor to follow Jesus, that he is with them in their midst. But but also I think it does something slightly more, which is going to do the same thing for us tonight. 
You see, if you think about the churches last week and you think about all their struggles that they were enduring and we thought about what that meant for us and our struggles, it can essentially be distilled down to the same problem. It's a worship problem. You see, why do we think about everything in light of us? Why do we shrink everything down to being about us? Why do we view the world and circumstances and pressures through the lens of me, myself, and I? It's because we have a worship problem. We were created to worship God as creator. We were to worship Jesus as savior and redeemer. But so often we serve and worship self. This is the great truth of Romans chapter one. We exchange the truth of God for a lie and we serve and worship the created. And ultimately, the created one we often worship most is ourselves. Or perhaps it's a spouse or a child or the workplace or the bank balance or the home or the car, whatever it is. So often we're tempted to worship that. And what Revelation 1, 4, and 5 does is that it awakens us from that worship problem and causes and reorientates us to worship what is only worthy of worship. Think, think about it like this. What makes loveless Ephesus love? What makes faithful Smyrna be faithful even unto death? What keeps compromising Pergamum to repent? What makes tolerant Tyrophyra become intolerant to the things that compromise and hurt the people of God? What is it that, uh, that makes spiritually dead Sardis wake up? What is it that makes loyal Philadelphia endure? What is it that makes lukewarm Laodicea repent and be zealous? What is the answer to all of those questions? Is it is the same thing. It is a right perspective of who Jesus is and what's going on in the throne room right now. It is a reorientation to worship the true and living God and to understand our lives in light of his reality because heaven and earth are not detached, folks. What happens in heaven shapes and transforms us today. So that's what we're gonna see in chapters four and five today. A right reorientation of our worship so that we would come to serve and worship the true and living God. So please turn with me to Revelation chapter four and verse one. After this, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must soon take place after this. At once, I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are the four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of man, the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast down their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you our Lord and God to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. We'll finish our reading there and come on to chapter five in a few moments. But this is an incredible continuation of what God was revealing to John. You'll see in verse one and two that this is a new, uh, a new location, a new scene is taking place. You'll remember back in chapter one and verse, first few verses, John is called by, the, by God to, to, to Jesus, to the angel, to John, to write down what he sees. In chapter one, verse 19, you'll see that he was in the spirit, that same language, and he was, he was taken to see this Jesus unveiled of who he was. Now in chapter four, verses one and two, that same language, Language. I was in the spirit and, this, and the spirit called me to come to this new place, to this, this invitation. This tells us that there's something new happening, that John is in a new place. It's, it's, it's a vision that he now sees of what must soon take place. Chapter one, two, and three, we see that God was revealing what was happening then. And now John's gonna see something that is true of now, but also true of the future. 
and what a stunning vision he sees. What is it that he sees? Well, verse two, you see it. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven. The whole center point of chapter four is this throne. You, I want you later on to go back through this passage and I want you to circle every time you see the word throne. It happens 10 times in 11 verses. Then it's gonna happen four times in chapter five. The whole point of chapter four is that we are to see the throne. It is the, it is the spirit, there's one speaking to John who says and invites him to come. Behold, a door standing open in heaven. John is invited in. We're invited in. Come and see what's going on in this heavenly reality. There is a throne and there is one sitting on it. This is the reality. It is heaven's throne room. And what happens here when we come to see it and hear it utterly transforms and transcends our very existence today. For what is happening in heaven right now? Is God freaking out? Oh my goodness, I never realized that COVID would have this impact. I don't know how I'm going to overcome the problem of COVID. How are we going to overcome this problem, son and spirit? How are we going to do this? No, there is no problems in heaven, only plans. There is no panic here. And let's see that there's no panic in heaven. Verse two, there is a throne stood in heaven and there is one seated on the throne. The throne is occupied. Contrary to popular opinion, contrary to cultural noise and rhetoric who say that there is no throne and if there is a throne, God can't be there because of all the suffering in the world. Well, we're, we're really mistaken if we think that. There is a throne in heaven and there is one sat on the throne. And John, you'll remember as he writes This is apocalyptic literature. As he describes what he sees, he uses vivid symbols because his own human words are too finite to describe what he sees. And John goes on to describe who he sees on the throne using rich imagery of these precious jewels. Look with me in verse three. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. What we're to see is this dazzling display of majesty. This jasper, which is like a white diamond or a multifaceted stone that that can, in in the glimpse of light that comes into it, you would think that it has multiple colors, but what it's trying to convey is majesty and holiness and purity. This carnelian was known for its kind of red blood color. It's trying to show that this one on the throne is majestic and holy and pure, but also he is the one who is just and has judgment and has wrath rightly within him. And then we see this emerald rainbow. What that's trying to convey is his covenantal faithfulness. And it is around the throne because you can see the whole of the rainbow over him, not just from a heaven, an earthly perspective where we see like half of a circle, but from a heavenly perspective, we see everything. And we're to see this one here who is described in this resplendent display of beauty, of holiness, of purity, of majesty. And when you come to see this throne, what you come to learn in chapter four is that the throne is at the center because everything that we're gonna see now following this description of the one sat on the throne is everything else that's described in relation to the throne. So you'll see the language of around the throne and from the throne and before the throne. We're to come to see that the throne is at the center and everything has its existence and its being in relation to the throne. So look with me again in verse six. Before the throne is the burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. We, we know already that that means the Holy Spirit. And before the throne, there was, as it were, a sea of glass, like crystal. The Spirit is before the throne. We see that it's like this crystal sea. Well, why is that described there? Well, what it's conveying, because to a first century reader, the sea was, what was, was chaotic, it was unknown, it was vast, it was big. It, it was something to be feared. But, but in heaven, it's not to be feared. It's calm. It's like crystal because you can see through it and you can see beyond it. It's, it's not to be feared. What's that trying to teach us? It's teaching us that the one on the throne and everything around the throne is under its sovereign rule and care. There's no chaos in heaven. There's no problems in heaven. Only plans control. And the one who controls it is sat on the throne at the center of it all. 
And you look back with me at verse four, you'll see now we've seen before the throne, now we're gonna see around the throne. Around the throne, verse four, were the 24 thrones and seated on the thrones are 24 elders. Now there's, there, there's lots of debate about who these guys are, but very simply, they are the representations of all believers from both Old Testament and New Testament. It's simply taking the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 apostles of the New Testament church and they are, represent all believers from both sides of Jesus' uh, incarnation, both Old Testament and New Testament. So this isn't anything hard to understand. It's simply that around the throne of God are a representation of all God's people. And the reason why I think they are representations of, of all God's people and not angelic beings because of the word elders and consistently through the book of Revelation, elders refers to, 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 to men but, but also because everything they're described as has already been described for us in chapter three in the promises to the churches. So look with me again. Verse four, they were clothed in white garments of golden crowns on their heads. Well, that's what Jesus promised the church if they conquered and overcame. Look back, chapter three, verses four and five. Yet you, ha yet you have still a few names and sorrows, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. Well, you see that the ones on the throne are clothed in white garments. That's what God promised that they would have. Look again at chapter three, verse 11. I am coming soon. Hold fast what you have so that no one may seize your crown. Those who are believers, those who conquer, those who overcome will be in the presence of God and will have a crown. Well, chapter four, verse four, they have golden crowns on their heads and they're sat on thrones. That, that's not something to be afraid of, but that's what God promises in Ephesians 2 verse, verse 6, that we would be raised with him and seated in, in, on heavenly thrones, seated with him in the heavenly places. So, so this is, I think, is simply saying that we here in Christ will be with him in his place, around his throne. How incredible is this, that the one who rules all things, who, who was, who is, and is to come, the eternal one, brings us into his presence and shares his rule with us by giving us a, a new garment, white garments to signify our purity. We give us crowns to show that we share in the inheritance of Christ. How incredible is this God, this throne room, that we will come and be able to be in his presence and share with him. Then you'll see again around the throne. So we have the 24 thrones around the throne and then we have four, four living creatures around the throne, verses six to eight. The first like a lion, the second like an ox, the third like the face of man, the fourth like an eagle in flight. Well, these four creatures simply represent all of creation. The number four was the, the, the earth's number, you could say, in Revelation. And we know that from all throughout the Bible, the number four was always referred to all of creation, like the four winds of the earth or the four corners of the earth. And it describes all those who are created, creatures. And it shows essentially all those who are the strongest in their field in some way, that the lion, the ox, the eagle. And man is there because we are created in the image of God. You see, what normally happens in our day and age and throughout history is that, uh, that, that animal imagery is often used by countries in their flags or, or whatever it is to display a symbol of their power. We, we know England has the lion, America has the eagle, Russia has the bear. And these are simply ways to portray uh, the, 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 the assemblance, the symbol of that country to display its power. But in heaven's throne room, God doesn't use these to show how powerful he is. Rather, all of creation comes to point to the one who has ultimate power, it's God himself. Because when you look at verse eight, you see what they do. In verse eight, each of them have six wings, which should remind us of Isaiah six, of Ezekiel one. They are full of eyes all around and within and day and night. They never cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God almighty who was and is and is to come. All the creation all of creation come to point to the one who has majestic, supreme power. And this takes us on to our second point of this chapter. 
Not only what does John see, we have to ask what does John hear? And here it begins. What does John hear? He hears worship. Worship is the activity of the throne room. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. This freefold repetition it is simply saying of his infinite holiness in, in his past, in his present, and in his future. This, this infinite worthiness and holiness that has been manifested. God's beauty is so intense. It is so intense that it undoes us and if we were in its presence, it would crush us. And day and night, they never cease to worship the one who has created them. It's like they're in his presence and they can't shut up talking about how awesome God is. And then you see in verse nine that whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him. That this is everything in heaven. Remember, we've seen it described. There's the 24 thrones and there's the four living creatures. And what is their activity? What is their purpose? What do they do in the presence of God? They worship and they fall down and worship as, as the four living creatures worship. The 24 elders don't want to miss out. They want to join in with their own chorus. They cry out, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. They fall down prostrate. They threw down their crown. Not out of, uh, we don't want this, but out of their own unworthiness. They know that all that they have, the white garments, the crown, the throne, they haven't merited it. They throw it back saying, we're not worthy. This is all from you and by you. So we throw it down and worship to you. We want to give you all that we have, all that we are. We throw it down in worship. We aren't worthy. You are worthy. Worthy are you, our Lord and God. And you see the difference you see the difference in the two choruses of worship? All of, cre- all, of cre- all the creatures, all of the creation worship, holy, holy, holy. But the 24 elders, the representations of all God's people have a personal chorus. Worthy are you, our Lord and God. Why? Because all of God's people are now brought into this intimate living relationship with the living true God. So they worship him as a personal chorus of worship to the one who has saved them. Worthy are you was actually a a, a tagline that the emperor Domitia had created. That people at this time and this people who were living at the same time as those receiving this letter were told and commanded to worship him using these words. But isn't it amazing to see that these churches as they received this, they would come to see that Emperor Domitian is not worthy of worship. He's just a man. The only one who is worthy of our worship is the one who is seated on the throne. And you see, folks, when we come to see chapter four, we're to have a reorientation. We're to have a transcendent experience to come to see what is happening in heaven. The one who is in heaven, the one who is ruling and in control, we're to come to see this and have our eyes utterly transformed that there is a throne. There is one on the throne and the worship, and worship is the activity of the throne room. You see, folks, this should utterly transform and change our perspective that contrary to popular opinion, who said that there isn't a throne, there isn't one on a throne, there's nobody ruling, there's nobody in control, there's nobody in charge. Revelation 4 comes to say, no, appearances may be deceiving. There is a throne and there's one on it. We're to go and take that message to the world. This world isn't out of control. God is in control and he's worthy of all worship. You see that God is, uh, is worthy of worship, verse 11, to receive glory and honor and power. For he created all things and by his will they existed and were created. You see, the one who is on the throne has created all things and all that he has created should return in worship and praise to him. For only he is worthy of, cre- of worship. This should utterly transform our own personal understanding and perspective on life. Why? Because we aren't at the center of the existence of the world. We are not on the throne. We are not the answer to all people's problems. We're not even the answer to our own problems. We are not at the center of existence. We aren't on the throne. God is on the throne. Everything isn't dependent on us. Not everyone is dependent on us. 
We aren't even the answer to our own problems, never mind the problems of the world. This one is. We aren't con- to consider all of life. We're not to consider all the circumstances in our life. We're not to consider all cultural problems and make sense of life through the perspective of self. We're to make sense of all those things through this perspective that God is on the throne. God is in control. God will not be ousted from power. He is ruling. He is reigning. He is worthy of our worship. We need to understand who we are in light of who he is and where he is right now. And then we make sense of our lives from that true reality. Folks, honestly, what is it that will utterly transform these churches that are being written to? What makes loveless Ephesus love? What is it that makes uh, Smyrna keep going even in the face of death and so on? What is it? It is this heavenly reality. God is on the throne. God is ruling. God is reigning. Wake up. Calm down. Don't worry. There are no problems in heaven, only plans. So calm down. Folks, we need to take what we behold and what we love most in this world. We need to ask us ourselves our serious question right now. What is it and who is it that you are giving your love and your worship to? What is it that you are beholding the most in your life? What is it you're clinging on to with closed hands and worshiping and living for? What is it that, that if you lost it, you would say, life's not worth living anymore? What is it? And I need you to come to see that that is a created thing. And it was never meant to be the center of your worship or your affection. It was never meant to be the thing that you give your love to. Because it is created. Rather, you're to give your worship, your love, your joy, your purpose, your meaning to the one who created you. And you're to worship him. And you're to make sense of your life in light of the fact that he is the creator. And he is worthy of all worship. And when you do that... That gift in your life, you will love it better. You'll be a better spouse, a better parent, a better friend, a better work colleague. When God is the one who receives your ultimate worship, then we become more effective in the world that we're called to do. So ask yourself, what robs you? What robs your affection of worshiping God? And repent of it. And come to see that you're not in control of it. You're not in control of your kids. You're not in control of their destiny. You're not in control of your boss. You're not in control of your workplace's destiny. You're not in control of that relationship. You're not in control of your finances. These are all created realities. And the one that you give worship to is the one who created all those things. So repent. Turn away from trying to control and manipulate and augment reality. And come back to the one who is the center of all reality and worship him. And you will come to experience a freedom and a liberty in your life. And you will be able to to love God and love others in a better way. Because you're not depending upon these things for your identity. You're not worshiping these things, expecting something in return that they were never meant to give you. Your, Your kids will thrive better. Your spouse will thrive better. Your friendships and relationships will thrive and flourish when you stop looking at them to give you something that they were never meant to give. So let's repent, folks, all of us, and stop worshiping the created and come and join with the chorus of the four living creatures and the 24 elders and fall down prostrate and give him all the worship and glory and find true freedom and liberty in our lives, folks. Honestly, come and worship the true and living God. If all of the activity of, the, of heaven is worship of him, it means that all the activity of our lives here on earth is to be worship of him. In and through every aspect of our lives with every ounce and fiber of our being. We're only halfway. How awesome is this? Then I saw chapter five, verse one. In the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. Let's just pause. What's happened? You see, what's happened in John as he comes into the throne room, his eyes are directed on the throne. And what happens is the camera angle essentially zooms out from the throne room. The throne, the one on the throne, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, and the camera angle zooms out into this huge avalanche and chorus of praise. Now what happens in chapter 5? It's the same vision, but it's a second part. It's like the camera zooms back into the throne. And in the hand of the one seated on the throne in his right hand 
is a scroll written within and on the back. So both sides are written on and it's sealed with seven seals. This is a continuation of the vision that John sees. And written on this scroll, front and back. So something is written down. It's, it's intelligible. It's ordered. There's, there's something there. There's a plan. What is it that he holds? Well, I think I know what it is. I think it is the, the, the consummation. It is the plans of, of all of history. And, and what it comes in the fullness of this scroll, I think, is everything from creation to redemption. And then everything through to the final day when Christ will return and beyond. In his hand, all God's plans, all the plan of history and the consummation of all things. But it's closed. It's closed. Nobody can access it. Nobody can read it because it's sealed with seven seals. And the question comes out from the throne room in verse two. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? What's he saying? He's saying that somebody needs to come to break the seven seals, to unravel the scroll and begin to execute the plan that is on this scroll. And the question goes out, who is worthy to open the scroll? What a question. We need somebody to break the seals and execute the plans of God. Who is that going to be? The question isn't what's on the scroll. The question is, who can open the scroll? Who can execute God's plans? Is John worthy? Is that why he's been brought here? Is this angel who proclaims the question, is that angel worthy? Are the four living creatures worthy? Are the 24 elders worthy? Are you worthy? Am I worthy? Well, no. Verse three, no one in heaven or on earth or on the earth was able to open the scroll or even look into it. No one is worthy. No one is found. There is no one to come to execute the plans of God and disinfect this world of all its evil and bring about the new creation that we all long for and are yearning for. So what is John's response to verse four? I began to weep loudly because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look into it. He weeps because he understands what the scroll is. He weeps because nobody is worthy enough to open it and to execute its plans. Of course, weeping is the overwhelming response of John and it should be the overwhelming response of us. This is the drama. This is the tension in the throne room. We need one who is worthy to bring about God's purposes if there is none then there's no justice, there's no judgment, there's no new creation. If there isn't one who is found worthy, everything we endure and suffer is meaningless. Anything we do is meaningless if one is not found. It will mean that, not, that, will mean that everything we endure will not be brought about for good. It means that what we experience now is not a light momentary affliction. It means that we who are dead, and who will, we will not rise in Christ on that final day. This is what it means. Feel the tension. We should weep if there is not one worthy. Do you want that? Every broken thing that's happened to you, every hardship you've endured, everything that you've persevered in to be meaningless, to count for nothing. We need one who is worthy. And the sweet words come, verse five, weep no more. So everything you have endured, everything you've had to persevere in, everything you've had to walk through as a saint in Christ, everything you've had to navigate with the hardship, the toil, the pain, everything that you've wept over, longed for, desired in your life, one has been found. Weep no more. Weep no more is the worship activity, is the, is the message of heaven to earth today. Weep no more. Weep no more is the message from the throne room to the church in Ephesus and Sardis, to Pergamum, to Laodicea, weep no more, wake up, calm down. There is one on the throne and there is one worthy enough to take the scroll and break its seals. Weep no more. Who is worthy? Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David. There is one worthy. This takes our minds back to all the messianic promises in the Old Testament. The one who will come in the line of Judah. The one who will come in the line of David. The, the king who will come and overthrow. The one who would win. The one who would bring redemption for all of Israel and salvation for all of us. The God-man, Jesus Christ. 
He's described almost as like a lion-like man who comes in the lion, the one who has conquered. Do you see that word again? The one who has overcome, the one who is victorious. Here he is, the lion of Judah, the root of David. It's a man, the one who lived in our place, the one who died on the cross, the one who rose again, the one who ascended and is now ruling from the throne room of heaven. He is worthy. This is Jesus. He is worthy. So John turns to see this lion, this lion-like man, the one who has conquered. He's looking for strength, the, the strong one who can break the seals. And he turns, verse six, between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. Hold on a second. The lion was the one that conquered. So John turns to see not a lion, but a lamb. In fact, when you look at the, the kind of original, it can actually be seen as little lamb. It, it, it's trying to convey that one that on appearances seems weak and vulnerable. Because how threatening is a lamb? How strong is a little lamb? And this lamb is standing though it had been slain. With seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. So while he may have seen and describes the one he saw as a lamb, he is actually strong. Because the seven horns are a symbol of strength. The seven eyes are the one who is all seeing. Who, who else have we seen described who is all powerful and all strong and all seeing? Well, we know it is the Jesus that was described in chapter one. Though he may have expected a, lamb, a lion, he sees a lamb. He describes Jesus as a lamb. He sees Jesus, not literally a lamb. Why does he use the term lamb? Why does he describe the one there's lamb? Because it's to take us back, to remind us of the Passover lamb who was slain in the place so that the firstborn male wouldn't die. The one who was described in Isaiah 53, the lamb who was slaughtered. The one that John proclaimed at the beginning of his gospel. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Here is that lamb standing though slain. He is worthy. He is worthy of praise. He is the one who is worthy to open the scroll. He is the one who can take it from the hand, verse seven. He can take the scroll from the right hand of him who is seated on the throne. Here is one worthy, it's Jesus himself. You see, the gospel might not make sense to the world. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians. It's foolishness to the world, but in the eyes of God, it is wisdom. And here it is, while it might not make sense or seem wise in our eyes, but should be. Because this is the gospel time and time again. Strength doesn't come by a lion tearing us to pieces. Strength comes by a lamb being torn to pieces for you. A lamb was slain, slaughtered, butchered. And he is the one who is ruling and reigning today. This is the tension. How can sinful humanity be in the presence of a holy God? It is through this slain lamb who is strong and all seeing and all powerful. He is the one now at the center of the throne room of heaven. He is the one at the center of the four living creatures. He is the one at the center of the 24 thrones. This little slain lamb. The tension is resolved. How can sinful humanity be in the presence of a holy God? Because of this one. And look what happens. Now we move from what John saw to what John heard, verse seven, verse eight, sorry. And when he took the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fall down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you made them a kingdom and priest to your God and they shall reign on the earth. They articulate his work. You were slain. Your blood has ransomed and redeemed, has purchased, has forgiven a sinful people so that we could be brought back to him. He has purchased the people and presents them to the Father. And the angels present the prayers of us, his people, as a sweet aroma to the one on the throne. And we now become a kingdom, priests. We now represent God to the world. We represent the work of Jesus to the world. This lamb has conquered through death and suffering and through his suffering and death and his blood, he has purchased us and redeemed us. So of course, he is worthy. Of course it's him. It's only him. 
just think about this. What would you buy God to express your love and affection for him? Would you buy me? Would you, would you buy you? Would I buy you? Would you buy yourself knowing what you know about your heart? And would you give yourself as a present, as an offering to the one sat on the throne, as a, as an, as a sign of your, uh, uh, an object of your affection and love and adoration for God? Well, this Jesus seems to think that that was a good idea. This Jesus seemed it fit and worthy to die, to purchase us, and then to present us to the Father and say, this is how much I love you. I have purchased this people for you. Who is worthy? This one. And I'm not arguing with him. I have no point to argue with him other than to receive that as much as it blows my head to say, thank you, Jesus. So of course you're the one that is worthy to open the seals and the scroll. Just think, folks, what dignity and value we have in the eyes of Jesus that he saw fit to die. So don't you ever put yourself down when Jesus saw it fit to purchase you by his blood. And don't you ever put anyone else down whom Jesus has seen fit to purchase by his blood. What value and dignity and worth we have in the sight of Jesus and the Father that he would die and present us. What kind of throne room is this? What, ta- what kind of throne room is this? None of this type of throne room is seen anywhere else in the world. There's no kingly ruler who functions like this, is there? And look at this song they sing. They sing a new song. They sing a new song of redemption. This is a new personal song. And this is a song that we join with. All of our song, all of our lives should be living sacrifices, acceptable worship, pleasing to this God. We, they sing a new song of redemption. This is stunning, folks. This is the song of your life. This is the soundtrack of your life. We all have Spotify playlists, I'm sure. Well, this is the song we sing. It's a new song of redemption. It's a new song of our lives. What does that mean? It means that we no longer walk to the drumbeat of the cultural narrative of arrogance and ignorance and autonomy and independence and selfishness. None of that will ever exist in a new creation. No longer do we walk to the beat of sin and sickness and suffering and relational breakdown, adultery, lust, greed, gluttony, self-gratification, self-serving, self-centered worship. No No longer will we walk to that soundtrack anymore because this is the song that is sung in heaven right now. Worthy is the lamb who was slain. He has purchased us. We will never have to worry about any sin when we are in the presence of the Father. And we will never grow weary. Our voices will never grow hoarse because he is worthy of our worship and we will give him all of our praises gladly, willingly, voluntarily. We will join with all of the heaven and worship him for all eternity and we'll never mind the depths of his riches, of his grace in Christ Jesus. And we'll never run out of superlatives to say for the Holy Spirit will continue to remind us and fuel our worship of the one who is worthy. So what is it that makes loveless Ephesus love? What is it that makes faithful Smyrna keep going on to death? What is it that makes compromising Pergamum repent? What is it that makes tolerant Tyre fire be intolerant to what harms God's people? What is it that makes spiritually dead Sardis wake up? What is it that makes loyal Philadelphia endure? What is it that makes lukewarm Laodicea repent and be zealous? What is it that makes me and my selfishness and my self-glorifying, my sinful self-worshipping and viewing all of life through the lens of me, myself and I? What is it that will stop us being so insecure in our relationships and friendships that we hear things and we fear friendships instead of enjoying them? What is it that will awaken us from the slumber of our depression and our fear and our guilt and our shame, believing that everyone out there is to get us, everything in the world is against us? What is it that will awaken us from our spiritual lethargy and lukewarmness. Please, Jesus, wake us up from our slumber of our spiritual lethargy and lukewarmness of not serving, of not praying, of not turning up, of not giving, of not being there for other people. 
Wake us up, Jesus. What is it? It is this throne room activity of worship of the Lamb and the one who is on the throne. It's the vision of Revelation 1, the Jesus that's unveiled, the ruling, conquering, slain Lamb, who is ruling from the epicenter of the throne room. And he says, I know, I see, I hear, keep going. I love you. I'm here for you. I've died for you. So I purchased you, redeemed you, and I've made you a kingdom of priests. Now serve me and love me and worship me and enjoy me. It is this vision. And what happens? All of heaven, all of creation erupts with worship. Verse 11, I looked and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads and myriads. That simply means innumerable. Thousands of thousands saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Worship erupts. Worship goes out from the throne room. Every creature, verse 13, in heaven and earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is within them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Worship the Lamb, the slain Lamb. He is worthy of all worship. Praise him, glorify him, honor him, for he is worthy. Look, look at the sevenfold description. Power. Wealth, wisdom, might, honor, glory, blessing. He is worthy of all those things. We're not. Those sevenfold description are everything in our selfishness and our sin we want. We want power. We want wealth. We want wisdom. We want might. We want honor. We want glory. We want blessing. And here we have a right reorientation. You're not at the throne. You're not in the center of the throne room. You're not on the throne. You're not worthy of worship. He is. So stop grabbing for created things to give you identity, meaning, and worth and give the worship to him. Give it back to him. Fall down with the elders, prostrate. Give it all back to him. Beginning right now in your home, tomorrow in your workplace, in your parenting, whatever you do, worship him with it. With every fiber and ounce of your being, worship him. For worship is what God is worthy of and deserving of. Just look back over these two chapters with me. Chapter 4, verse 8. The four living creatures begin to worship. Chapter 4, verse 9. The four living creatures. And then verse 10. The 24 elders join together in chapter 4. So the four living creatures, the 24 elders, worship the one on the throne for he is creator. But then in chapter 5, verse 9, we see the four living creatures and the 24 elders sing a new song of redemption. And then what happens, verse 11, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the myriads of angels worship. Then what happens, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, the angels, and then verse 13, every creature in heaven and earth worship. Every ounce and fiber of their being worships and is centered on the Lamb and on the one who is on the throne. Worship God for he is creator. Worship God and Jesus for he is worthy because of his redemption. Give him all of your worship. For we have seen him for who he truly is. We've seen what's really going on in heaven right now. No problems, only plans. And he is in control sovereignly. So four words for us as we close and we have a time of song worship. Wake up. Wake up. Appearances are deceiving. What's going on around us? Circumstantial pressure, cultural pressures. Appearances are deceiving. It may feel chaotic and out of control, but wake up to the greater reality. This is what's going on. God is in control sovereignly. So wake up. Look at the throne. Look at Jesus. There's no panic. Let's live life in light of this heavenly perspective. And my second two words, calm down. Stop being frantic. Stop being panicked. Stop being worried for our creator and redeemer is not worried. Let's pray that we would be calm, peaceful presences. Calm voices in our homes, in our families, in our workplaces. Christians out of all the people in the world should be calm, peaceful presences. Not chaotic, not out of control, not panicking. Because in the throne room of heaven, there is no panic. There are no problems, only plans. And the one who is worthy enough to execute those plans is worthy to take the scroll and to break its seals. So wake up, calm down. Worship God, worship 
Jesus. Serve and love other people. Stop living as if you're on the throne and you're the center of God's existence. You're not. He is. Jesus is. So let's reorientate ourselves around this. If there's anything we want you to get from Revelation, it is to find your rest, your security, your assurance of your past, your present, and your future, your sense of your being, your responsibilities, your relationships to be lived out from this perspective. We need our senses, our minds, our hearts inflamed with the beauty and the wonder and the majesty of this heavenly reality, which is our reality and soon to be our tangible reality. Lift your eyes, please. Have your minds and your hearts informed with truth, folks. And live out what we believe, which is this, and proclaim it as true. Our oh, Father, thank you for these chapters, that they exist in our Bibles, that they give us a true perspective on life. And I pray now by your Holy Spirit that you would cut off anything right now that is coming into our minds and our hearts to disagree with what you have revealed to us. Anything that makes us go, yeah, but please, Jesus, in the power of the Holy Spirit, would you break off the shackles of fear and worry and shame and guilt? Would you help us live in light of this greater reality? Would you help us lift our eyes off ourselves? Lift our eyes off our own realities, thinking that they are the be all and end all. Help us lift our eyes to see this heavenly reality and may the truth of this heavenly reality inform our current reality. Please, Jesus, I pray. Father, would you reveal yourself to us again by your Holy Spirit that we would see you for who you really are. And please, not allow the evil one to snatch from us the truth of chapters four and five of us or chapter one of us. That we, the weak and fragile and vulnerable and insignificant seemingly in the world, are actually your people that you've ransomed by your blood, made us a kingdom of your, a priest for you to represent and serve you and others in the world. So please, Father, meet with us now. Please, Jesus, meet with us now. Spirit, illuminate the truths. Convict us of our sin where that is rightly needed. Comfort us and assure us of our standing again and fuel us to live in light of this greater reality. Oh Jesus, as we sing now, yes, in our homes and not in person, nonetheless and nevertheless, receive this sung worship in our homes as beautiful praise to you for you are worthy of all praise and glory. We worship you humbly and we fall down before you now in adoration and praise and thankfulness and gratitude. We love you and we need you. And we ask all this in your gracious name. Amen.